Shalom, everyone. Shalom. In this most unprecedented pandemic year, we have uh, finally arrived at the season of Christmas. But as all of you are probably feeling, uh, it is very difficult to get into the mood for the season. But as all of you know, this coming Friday is the Christmas. And we only have one more Sunday before the end of this year. And then we don't really know what to look forward to next year. So there are all these uncertainties abounding all around us. Uh, we don't know exactly what to claim, what to expect. But there is one thing that we can claim for sure, and that is the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially in this Christmas season. And so today I am going to give a Christmas message. And I've titled the message, Divine Hiddenness. It's based upon Luke chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. And in a few minutes, we're going to read this text. But I want to give you a little bit of an introductory statement before we enter into this text. Uh, in this modern society, Christmas is so shrouded in all kinds of sentimentalism and commercialism. Uh, I don't know about you, but I grew up in the States. And before coming out to California, I grew up in the East Coast, in one of the southern states, a state called North Carolina. And there we had a tradition. When December comes around, we can tell that Christmas has come. Everywhere, the streets, the shopping malls, uh, the restaurants, uh, homes are lighted and ornamented. And there are Christmas carols all over. And we know that the season has arrived. And I really tasted what Christmas holiday was when I was in the state of North Carolina. But it's difficult, uh, especially in California, where things are much more spread out and much more sort of um, pastel in color and mood. It's very difficult to get into that mood. But coming out here in Korea too, I realized that unless you go to a certain sector, certain neighbors, or certain uh, busy streets and the malls, you would have no idea that this is the Christmas season. But... The problem that we have in the States uh, regarding Christmas is that Christmas is oftentimes associated with all kinds of sentimentality and commercialism. It's all about holiday spirit. It's about going shopping, presenting gifts to one another, singing the jingle bell songs and, and all this... Um, lightings and ornaments, and even in the churches. I remember long ago attending um, this huge mega church called Christa Cathedral. And this church was known for its two pageants. One, was the, one had to do with Easter celebration, and the other had to do with Christmas. And they titled the Christmas pageant, this great drama, theatrics, they put on, The Glory of Christmas. And they wanted to depict the Christmas in their own way, uh, as realistic as possible. But I personally felt that they overdid that. For example, they had all these angels flying in the air, you know, and they had uh, all the strings attached to them and, and wired up. And it was spectacular. Angels were just all over the sanctuary, flying around. They had the huge pageant of the Magi, the wise men coming in you know, from the east, from Persia. And they had all this pageantry. They even had live camels. Can you believe that? And it was kind of embarrassing when the camel kind of pooped on the stage and all, but, but it was glorious. Everyone felt like, wow, this is Christmas. But is that the right picture of Christmas? Is that what happened in the very first Christmas when Jesus was born into this world? 
And if you examine the Bible, and if you know some facts about the context in those days, in the early first century Palestine, you know that Jesus was not celebrated with a, some kind of fanfare or some great procession or pageant or some kind of theatrics. As a matter of fact, even the angels, no one could see them except for some shepherds whose eyes were open to, to see this great uh, host of angels. So Jesus was now recognized by the world in his first coming. He was recognized only by a handful of people like Mary and Joseph, some shepherds, some godly folks like Simeon and Anna, and of course, some magi who came from supposedly Persia. And it might have taken them over a year or so to have arrived. But for the rest of the population in Palestine, and for that matter, the whole world, we were completely oblivious of his coming. That's why John says in his gospel, chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. You see, what we see in the Gospels is a picture of Jesus actually being hidden to the world in general. We see in the Gospels Jesus only being recognized by those who have received special grace and some kind of revelation. So the way Jesus came into this world clearly shows the very nature of his hiddenness or the hiddenness of God and the revelation of God given only to those who have special grace from God. So I want us to examine this particular Christmas text and I think in this text, very short and succinct text, I think we're going to see something wonderful about the hiddenness of God and the revelation of God. So I've titled the message today, Divine Hiddenness. Let's look at Luke chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her first son, firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. So how is God in Christ hidden? And how can we recognize God or Jesus even today? First thing that I would like to say about the divine hiddenness is that God seems to prefer through Jesus Christ, all that is of natural, and particularly through Jesus Christ, that is human. God was hidden in the humanness of Jesus. God was hidden in the natural order of His creation. Let's look at verse 6 and 7a, the first part of this text. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. Mary gave birth to a son, a child. A child was born. This is a human child who was born in the most natural way, and he came into this world. You know, everything that is talked about Jesus his early childhood, and there aren't much data or information in the Gospels, but we have plenty, clearly shows us that he led a very normal childhood life. That he grew up just like us, in stature, that is physically, in wisdom, that is in his mental or emotional state, in favor with God, and with other human beings. In other words, he had a social and a relational dynamic, both with humans and with God. 
He led a very normal life. There's nothing fantastic about the way Jesus grew up. And yet, what people think about God and, and the presence of God is that somehow he operates only in the realm of the fantastic or the spectacular or the supernatural or the miraculous. And yes, later in his ministry years, Jesus did operate that way. He healed the sick. He cast out demons. He did all kinds of major miracles. He even raised the dead. We know that. But we need to remember, for the 30 years of his life preceding those spectacular ministry years, Jesus' life was very normal, very human, very natural. And that's where God wants to uh, reveal himself through his hiddenness in the humanness of Christ. In John chapter 1, verse 14, it says that the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word, the Logos, that is the divine Son of God. He became flesh and He made His natural dwelling among us. He was human. He was part of the creation. But who is this? who was human, who became part of the creation. This is none other than the Son of God, the divine Son Himself. And according to John, he says all these apostles and all these witnesses, we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. He recognized this glory. He recognized this fullness of grace and truth in this person of Jesus Christ. He recognized God through Jesus Christ who came as a human being, who came as a part of the natural order of creation. But right before that text, in the earlier text, this is what it says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of man. He's talking about the identity of Jesus. What He and the other apostles, they witnessed, was Jesus in the flesh. Jesus in the natural order of things. They were able to actually see Him, hear Him, touch Him. They were able to relate to Him. He bodily existed. But what John is saying here is, who is this Jesus? From the very beginning of his gospel, he says this is none other than the one who was with God the Father. This Jesus, being the Logos, he himself was God. He's the one who was there from the very beginning. He's the one who made everything. He's the creator God. In him was life and light. The source of all that is of creation. So you see, even today, we Christians, we struggle with uh, this sort of a, a residue or remnant of Gnosticism. Gnosticism was all already there in the first century Palestine in its primitive form. Then it developed even more in terms of philosophy and spirituality. And what is Gnosticism? Gnosticism basically operating with the dualistic philosophy that human beings are comprised of two parts. There's the fleshly part and there's the spiritual part. As a matter of fact, all that is of creation is in two parts. The physical and the spiritual. And what the Gnosticism is basically saying is that everything that is of the physical order of things particularly human flesh, are something very, very inferior and perhaps even very impure. It may be associated with sin or sinful tendencies. But the spirit, spiritual realm, is something that is pure and superior. And the name of the game is for the spirit to be released from the flesh 
and so that it can find its perfect sense of existence, free floating out there in the spirit realm. This is what Gnosticism says. And Apostle John, when we see his first epistles, he is very much concerned about this tendency. For these Gnostic Christians to think of even Jesus in that same way. So they could not fully affirm the fact that Jesus came in the flesh and that the flesh is good. And that Jesus came into the natural order of things, the physical and the material. That this is good. This is a good thing. This is a good news. But they were rather saying, no, no, the whole idea was for Jesus to separate himself from that and be out of here once he got his mission accomplished, dying on the cross for us. And some Gnostics, known as Docetic Gnostics, they were basically saying Jesus' flesh wasn't really a flesh. You know, we think that's his flesh, but no. It was not a complete flesh. It was more of a spiritualized flesh, or it was a flesh that is of di different dimension. And they kept on idealizing things. They kept on fantasizing about the fact that Jesus was not a normal human being. And according to John, this was heresy. Because what he wanted to get across to the church in his days, and to all of us even now, is that Jesus was really human. Ordinary human, just like us. But in that humanness, the divine or the Godhood was there. This is a mystery. But in this mystery, we can learn one thing. If you want to see God, we have to learn to see God in the human realms as well. In other words, when we see a human person out in the society, if it is a very perfect human specimen, somebody who is very talented, very gifted, very intelligent, uh, very much like an idol or superstar, then we don't have any problem thinking that somehow God has endowed this person with special grace. But when we see people who are lacking physically, handicapped, mentally damaged, or lacking something in terms of skill or talents, we tend to look at them with disdainment. We tend to ignore them. We tend to write them off. But what is the difference between this kind of person who just had some mishaps, very unfortunate, having grown up in a very difficult type of settings and maybe his body or his mind is damaged, from somebody who is very fortunate to be endowed with so many gifts and talents what is the difference? There's really no difference when it has to do with the image of God. Because both of these figures bear the image of God. In other words, if we can recognize, even amongst the poor, even amongst those who are despised, even amongst the outcasts of the society, the handicapped, the broken and shattered people, if we can recognize God, His image embedded in them, then we, we come to understand what the essence of Christmas is all about. Because even Jesus came in the flesh. And no one expected the Messiah to come in the flesh. Just the normal flesh. Like typical flesh. They probably expected some kind of superhuman flesh. Like Superman coming from the planet Krypton. You know, and arriving on Earth. On a spaceship. Endowed with all these abilities and power. But Jesus didn't come that way. He came as a normal child. So if that child uh, fell on the ground, he would have skinned his knees. Uh, if that child was helping his earthly dad, Joseph, in the carpentry shop, and he, he hammered him, his thumb or he, he cut himself, he'll bleed just like anybody else. If somebody said nasty things uh, amongst the young kids growing up in Nazareth, he would have been hurt and offended. Jesus was human just like us. And yet, in that humanness, God was there. God was hidden in that humanness. And most of the people could not recognize God in what is human and natural. Second thing I want to talk 
say about divine humanness is that we find this in the most common and the ordinary. Let's go back to the text. In verse 7, the B portion of this text, it says, She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And even from this text, we recognize that this family that Jesus came into, family of Mary and Joseph, they must have been just common people. Certainly not an aristocratic elite class. They must have been common people. Why? Because they were basically rejected by the inn. You know, even though during that season and time of census taking, uh, people were all flocking to their own countries, and, and, and particularly in Bethlehem, all the rooms were taken. But if they were of the aristocratic or noble status, Certainly, they would have made room for them. But there was no room for them, clearly, because the innkeepers and all the business people, they gave their priority to those who could afford them. So we know that Jesus was born into a peasant family, a lower-class family. Nothing spectacular about his status when he entered into this world. There was no room for him in the inn. That means the people did not recognize his family. They didn't dress in any particular way that would catch their attention. They didn't uh, have an entourage that they would cause people to admire them. Remember, he... Joseph basically escorted Mary on a donkey and, and basically made his way through the dusty roads and arrived in Bethlehem. They were just plain common people. And another evidence, mind you, there are not many, many biblical data regarding the early days of Jesus. But we do have sufficient data. For example, in Luke chapter 2, verses 22 and 24, there's this statement here. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, that is, Mary, now after giving birth, she has to go through this purification process. And Joseph and Mary took him, Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And at the same time, this must have been around 40 days or so, because purification rite, a woman who just gave birth has to go through, this happens around 40 days after the birth. And so they take Jesus to Jerusalem and they also want to dedicate Jesus to God. And what is this ceremony of dedication? Well, according to the, the history of Israel, uh, this is recorded in Levi 12 as well, that the firstborn must be dedicated unto the Lord. But if it was an animal, firstborn animal that was dedicated, that animal was slaughtered as a sacrifice unto the Lord. But a human being, it would be ridiculous to slaughter them. So instead of slaughtering them, they had to present a lamb and a dove as an offering, sacrificial offering to the Lord. And a Levite would take their place, saying, I will now dedicate the rest of my life unto the Lord. So this is a sort of a, an idea of substitution. Okay? And the type of offering that was presented the norm was for a family to offer a lamb and a dove. But just in case, they could not afford that. They don't have the money. They don't have the income. There was another option, and that was to offer two doves instead. And this is exactly what we see here. In verse 24, and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves and two young pigeons. That's what they offered because they could not afford a lamb. Of course, theologians make a big deal about the fact that the lamb is Jesus himself and all that. But if we just look at the fact here, there must have been 
or lower class of family. Whatever the data may be, we know that they were common people. They were just ordinary people. So we should not try to fabricate the idea that somehow they, they had so much more. There's nothing about that family that was so much more. Even the people who recognized him were all commoners. Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, Simeon, Anna, they were common folks. Only exception was the Magi. Of course, they were the religious and intellectual elites of their days, but they were able to recognize him only by the leading of a special star that they saw in Persia, and they followed that. And it must have taken over a year or so. So we need to also appreciate the fact that, that God is hidden in the things of the ordinary and the common. Just think about Jesus' 30 years of life before he entered into this spectacular ministry of signs and wonders. He grew up in a most normal way. He took on a very normal job. And he was a tecton. That means simply that he was a builder. He worked with his hands. You might even call him an artisan or craftsman. But he worked for a living. To put bread on the table for his widowed mom and his siblings. He worked very, very hard. And he led through a very ordinary life. Nothing much is written about Jesus in his former 30 years of life. Why? Because it was so ordinary. It was so common. Nothing fantastical about it. Now, I know that there are fictional writers who love to speculate as to what Jesus might have done. They want to make Jesus into something great. And they go out of the bound of what the Bible says about Jesus. And they like to speculate about his previous 30 years life. That he went to India, that he went to Himalayas. He was taught by these special gurus and, and lamas and, and uh, the yogis. And he received special power, came back to Palestine and started doing signs and wonders type of ministry. All these speculations are not necessary. Why? Because the Bible is very clear. Sometimes the Bible speaks volumes through the words, but sometimes through silence. If the Gospels depict Jesus, former 30 years of life, relatively silent, relatively hidden, that's exactly why. Because his life was relatively hidden. But in that hiddenness, God was there because Jesus himself was God. God was right there in the common and the ordinary. Not something spectacular or fantastical. He was there in the ordinary and common things of life. And this clearly is a lesson to us. That we must excel in the things of the ordinary and the common. Everyday work out there. For me, my, my job as a professor on an everyday basis, helping the students and struggling through. Ordinary and common stuff of life. Housewives with, struggling with kids and doing the chores at home. Businessmen making a living, you know, uh, selling the products and, 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 and their relationship building with their clients and customers. All of these, the ordinary life that we enter into, that's where we find God. Not some spectacular things. The final thing that I want to say is this. This is what I recognize in this text. That we see divine hiddenness in the lowly and despised. Let's look at that same text, the latter portion of the text that we read. She wrapped them in cloths and placed them in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. What is a manger? Manger is a feeding trough of animals. In other words, Jesus was born in a barn. Usually, this might be a sector of a house where the Jews in those days, 
they had their living quarter, but right next to their living quarter, in a little lower level, they kept animals as well. And perhaps the feeding trough of the animals were right there connecting the living quarters of the people and the living quarter of the animals. Right there, dividing those two sectors. They had these troughs, something that is sort of enclaved, and then they put hay and they put food for the animals. And so, Joseph and Mary, they cleaned up the feeding trough and they laid Jesus here in the manger. Usually not the norm for children. But in Jesus' case, there was no option. But this goes to show that Jesus was born in a most humble, a most debased type of setting. He certainly was hidden from the wealthy and the luxurious and, the, and those who are complacent. Those who are respected and popular and applauded. That his entire life, which began with being born and placed in a manger, leading a life of hard work as a carpenter or a worksman. And then even in his ministries, he's always reaching out to the outcasts of the society. And then his final death, hanging on the cross, Cross signifies a criminal's death, according to the standard of those days. No wonder Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8, states in a most noble way, before he elevates or exalts Jesus, and proclaims that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, because God the Father has exalted him. The prelude to that exhortation is this statement here in Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God is God. But he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He didn't just hold on to all the honor and the privileges and prerogatives of the fact that he was God and divine. But he made himself nothing. Not that he divested himself of his divinity, but he considered all these privileges and honor as God and as the King of kings and Lord of lords. He was willing to empty himself of all that. And in the process, he took the very nature of a servant. He chose servanthood. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. In other words, through Jesus' example, we see that God is hidden in the most despised of things. Not the most elevated of things, but we are so attracted to you know, glorious things. We're so attracted to the things which will catch our attention. But we despise the lowly things. We despise the people who are suffering. We despise the people who are in the dumps. Jesus didn't do that. He was born in a situation like that. And he ministered to people in situations like that. In other words, we find God the most in situations like that. In Isaiah 53 verses 1 to 3, there's this profound statement. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. And yet, who was this? This is none other than Jesus Christ. God Himself in this form. God Himself in this wretched form, being whipped and tortured, bleeding, and being hanged on the cross and dying. That is God right there on the cross. So we come back to another statement by Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 
to 24. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know Him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. The cross, the suffering, death and martyrdom, being persecuted and oppressed, being beaten and downtrodden, That's Christ. And Christ is none other than God himself. If Christ appeared this way and Christ ended his life this way, then how much more would God be willing to be hidden in the things that are despised, things that are lowly, things that are persecuted, things that are suffering? I see a huge theology here of divine hiddenness. This concept is not something that originated with me. This was a concept that was presented by the great reformer Martin Luther long ago. He presented to us the theology of the cross. That was his premier theology. Theology of the cross. Everything hinges on the cross. But in order to talk about the cross, he had to present the idea that God in his very nature is hidden from all that is of creation. And the technical term here is the Latin term, Deus absconditus. It means the hiddenness of God. Because God is not like humans. God is not like the created order of things. He transcends that. So we cannot reach up to Him. We are sort of living in this three-dimensional world, but God is beyond those three dimensions. He's into zillions of dimensions, beyond our comprehension. So we cannot possibly grasp him and see him. All throughout the Old Testament, the Israelites were warned, don't you even bother to seek God to see him because if you see him, you will die. You cannot see God and live. It is impossible to see him visibly. And so God is hidden in nature. But Luther says, this hidden God in nature came down as a human being and he revealed himself to us through Jesus Christ. And so he uses another term, Deus Revelatus. That means the revelation of God through Christ. And this revelation is particularly given through Jesus hanging on the cross. You see, if you see the cross, you will see that God. Only when you see the cross, you will see that God. You don't see the cross, you will not see that God. But having said that, Luther went one step further, which I really appreciate. And I actually wrote a thesis based upon this whole theology of Deus absconditus and Deus revelatus. And that is even Jesus hanging on the cross. That is a revelation of God, but people could not recognize that. He showed himself to the whole world and through the gospel message, we preach that to the whole world that this is none other than God himself revealing himself through this human Jesus who is suffering on the cross. Yet, once again, it's a sort of Deus absconditus for most of the people. Still, God is hidden because they refuse to see it. They refuse to believe. They are blinded from seeing God as revealed through Jesus Christ. You see? So there is this paradox. God shows himself. He clearly gives us insight and knowledge and understanding that this is where I show myself. I show myself through humanity. I show myself in the natural order of things, in creation. I have now removed myself from all of that creation. I'm hidden behind the scenes, so to speak. And I'm particularly hidden in the ordinary and common things of life. And I'm particularly hidden 
in the debased, lowly things of life. The things that we signify as the cross. I'm hidden there. But I'm not hidden there to play hide and seek with you. I am revealing myself to you. I am saying, this is me hanging on the cross. But it's hidden to you because you refuse to believe. It is only seen by those who believe. It is seen by only those who seek for truth. And if you're not seeking for truth, it will be like blindness to you. Because you would never see it. All throughout this year, we learned many, many lessons through COVID-19 situation. The whole world is given this lesson, this message by God as to what this is about. So many people said at the very beginning, this can't be God. We need to pray to God that he will remove COVID-19. Oh, this will pass away soon. And we're still saying the same thing. With the vaccines coming forth next year, this will be all removed. And we can go back to the normal pace of life. We're all missing out on the message of God. COVID-19 does not change the reality of God. God hasn't changed one bit. He was right there in COVID-19. He was right there in this pandemic world. He has not changed one bit. As a matter of fact, if we have the eyes with which we can recognize him, he was more present in COVID-19 situation than ever before. And yet we miss out on him. Oh, all these sufferings, all this fear, all this anxiety, all this economic plummeting, all the business shutting down, and all those lockdowns. And we say, who is God in this? That's exactly where God is. That's what we need to recognize. God is right there in the pandemic. And he's causing us to really see God. Why? Before pandemic, we saw God in spectacular things. The churches that are growing and movements that's happening. That's God. There's revival services and conferences. That, that's God. All these spectacular things people said were God. And maybe. I'm not denying that. But then suddenly everything changed and they see God nowhere around. I know of someone very close to me who is struggling right now with faith, issue of faith. I just heard about it. I'm trying to contact this person to minister to this person. Went through so much bad happenings on her life. So many negative things happening. So many things just being just poured out onto her. And she started out with strong faith. She stood her ground against all kinds of difficulties and sufferings and all kinds of havoc that's happening to her family. But now I hear that she's come to a breaking point. And she feels like God may not be there. Where is God in this? And I want to speak to individuals like her and those of you who think that God is not there in those situations. It is exactly the reverse that's true. God was more in those situations than ever before in your life. Everything else was fluff. This is real. And if you cannot have the eyes to see and recognize God in the midst of your sufferings and trials, in the midst of the pain and the anguish of the cross, then you will never see God as Jesus came to reveal God. Because you see, Jesus did not play this game of aristocracy. He did not play this game of elitism. He did not play, uh, play this game of great pageantry. No, that was the expectation of the Jews that the Messiah would come in glory and wipe out the Roman oppressors and establish the kingdom. But Jesus says, no. I come to suffer. I come to serve. I come as a little baby born in a manger, the feeding trough of animals. I debase myself to the level of the animals. 
And I will work with all those who are suffering, who feel like they're no better than the animals. And Jesus says, you're all mine. You belong to me. I'm right there in your midst. Isn't that what the Christmas message is about? And so you see, you cannot separate the Christmas message from the message of the cross. You know, these are not two separate events in the Christian calendar. These are joined together in one. Even in his birth, even in his growth, he was consistent through and through. I am here for those of you who can attach yourself to the cross. I suffer like you suffer. And I suffer for all those who are suffering. And there I'm hidden. But if you have the eyes of faith, you will see me. So he is both God who is hidden, God who is revealed. That's the paradox of faith. It is only through faith we can see the hidden God as the revelation of God. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much on this Christmas season when the world could not recognize your Son, Jesus Christ, coming into this world, nor even today. In this very season, people miss out on Jesus Christ because we get so distracted by the fluffs of life. Even Christians, in Christian churches, we are so much... uh, Obsessed with this idea of celebrating Christmas as a holiday and luxuriating with gifts and, and celebrations that we miss out. Jesus, who was born in a most humble state, laid in a manger, the feeding trough of the animals. That Jesus, who identified with those who are lowly and those who are common, those who are oppressed, those who are suffering. We have removed ourselves so far from that reality of the first Christmas. Lord, return us back to the essence of that first Christmas and the essence of the coming of Jesus in the flesh and what that was about and how you cannot separate that from Jesus dying on the cross for us. So Lord, we confess, yes, You are Deus absconditus, but at the same time, you are Deus revelatus through Christ and only through Christ. Because when we see Christ, we see the picture of truth and reality. May we all align to this reality that will set us free from all bondages and all hellish uh, struggles that we may be set free to finally see that God never, ever abandoned us. As a matter of fact, God was more real in His presence with us in those situations. Help us to know this, and knowing this truth, that we may be set free. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn His face towards you and radiate in all His glory, beauty, wisdom, and love. And may you now go forth with a true sense of confidence and faith and hope that the Lord is there with you ever more than before, even in this COVID-19 situation and even Uh, in the light of what else may come our way. If there is more of calamity and more of trials coming our way, then He will make His presence even more real to all of us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.